So we're going to read a little more about um, the Ezra's kind of last acts as part of the book of Ezra tonight with Ezra chapter 10. So let's first of all simply read the chapter, which I will do. I'm reading in the King James, so if it reads a little differently than what you have. Now when Ezra had prayed... And when he had confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children, for the people wept very sore. And Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said unto Ezra, We have trespassed against our God, and have taken strange wives of the people of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. Now therefore let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives, and such as are born of them, according to the counsel of my Lord, and of those that tremble at the commandment of our God. And let it be done according to the law. Thank you, Tom. Arise, for this matter belongeth unto thee. We also will be with thee. Be of good courage and do it. Then arose Ezra and made the chief priests, the Levites, and all Israel to swear that they should do according to this word. And they swear. Then Ezra rose up from before the house of God and went into the chamber of Johanan, the son of Eliashib. And when he came thither, he did eat no bread nor drink water, for he mourned because of the transgression of them that had been carried away. And they made proclamation throughout Judah and Jerusalem unto all the children of the captivity that they should gather themselves together unto Jerusalem, and that whosoever would not come within three days according to the counsel of the princes and the elders, all his substance should be forfeited and himself separated from the congregation of those that had been carried away. Then all the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered themselves together unto Jerusalem within three days. It was the ninth month on the twentieth day of the month, and all the people sat in the street of the house of God, trembling because of this matter and for the great rain. And Ezra the priest stood up and said unto them, you have transgressed and have taken strange wives to increase the trespass of Israel. Now therefore make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers and do his pleasure and separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the strange wives. Then all the congregation answered and said with a loud voice, As thou hast said, so must we do. But the people are many, and it is a time of much rain, and we are not able to stand without, neither is this a work of one day or two. For we are many that have transgressed in this thing. Let now our rulers of all the congregations stand, and let all them which have taken strange wives in our cities come at appointed times, and with them the elders of every city, and the judges thereof, until the fierce wrath of our God for this matter be turned away from us. <clears throat> Only Jonathan the son of Asahel and Jehaziah the son of Tikvei were employed about this matter, and Meshulam and Shabbatai the Levite helped them. And the children of the captivity did so, and Ezra the priest, with certain chief of the fathers, after the house of their father, and all of them by their names were separated, and sat down in the first day of the tenth month to examine the matter, and they made an end with all the men that had taken strange wives by the first day of the first month. Now, I'm actually not going to read the following verses, only because it is, a not that it's not important, but it is a list of names, which I'm not going to take the time to read, because I want to look at some things earlier in the chapter. It is a list of those, but the uh, verses I did not read from verse 18 through 44, is a list of those names of those people divided into priests, Levites, um, the Levites, and the singers, and the cantors, and then of actual the body of Israel that took strange wives and that they were separated through this action. But let's look a little bit more at the first part of the chapter. First of all, the first thing we read about is when Ezra had prayed. I just want to refer briefly back to chapter 9, verse 3. This is Ezra. And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment, my mantle, plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard, and sat down astonished. Then were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of the Lord, God of Israel, because of the transgression of those who be carried away, and I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. <clears throat> and at the evening sacrifice, I rose up from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread on my hands unto the Lord my God. Now, that was something like probably either this or this kind of position. I was recently um, uh, had the privilege of leading an SOD session. I think it was the 
dynamics of the building today. So in our SOD class, school of the software class, one thing we do is we kneel when we pray, right? So I asked the class, um, of the various faith groups that you know of today in the world, what faith group is most associated with a kneeling or prostrate position with prayer? What faith group? Muslim. Muslim. Right. Not Christian. But you can read other passages like this. I'm not going to actually go to this. Well, we am going to go to one because it's so significant. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 26, rather. Matthew 26, verse 39. Matthew 26, verse uh, 39. <coughs> This is uh, Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. And in Matthew 26, 39, it says, And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Now, um, I once saw there's a North Carolinian uh, native who was an illustrator, an outstanding illustrator, and did a book of illustrations of accurate biblical he illustrated this scene. And when I first saw it, um, it, I, it truly kind of took my breath away because I hadn't thought about what kind of posture Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah, would be in to pray. But the verse says this. I just didn't really think about it. The way he illustrated it, Jesus was like this. Okay. Now, the reason, I, the reason I show you that is, number one, as I mentioned, the faith group is not Christianity that is associated with prostrate prayer. And, and what does that position signify? Total subservience. You are, yes, totally submitted. Completely. You have nothing. And that's the way Jesus Christ, the Messiah, was, even though he's going to stop the whole thing. But that's the way he was. So, point being, that's what we see illustrated in Ezra chapter 10. 9 and 10, when he prays in 9. And interestingly, if you look at 10, just along the lines of prayer, <clears throat> if you look back at Ezra chapter 10, it says, now when Ezra had prayed, so we're still kind of in the praying mode, even though in Ezra 10, he starts to refer to himself in the third person. We, we believe he's the, still the writer, but he's now referring to himself as if he's over there and not first person, right? In any case, when you get down to verse 4, the fellow that says, you know, we've sinned, we need to fix this. And we want you to fix it. You know, we're going to believe in you to fix it. In verse 4 it says, arise. So it may be that Ezra was still in that posture of prayer for all of that prayer and all of that happened. People congregating. And of course, think about Ezra now. Okay? It says he plucked out his hair. I, I don't know if it was all of it. He plucked out his beard. Don't know if it was all of it. Tore his clothes. Remember, you didn't go to Walmart to buy clothes back then. They were hand woven. You tore something. It was significant. It cost a lot of money, and you just ripped it in half. So those are all significant things. But then also, um, down a little further, let's see, uh, in verse 6, we see in verse 4 it says, Arise, and then in verse 6 it says, Then Ezra rose up. So probably he was continuing in that posture of prayer. And the ta I don't have life lessons actually up here on a slide, but... <coughs> Your posture of prayer should be one of submission, whether it's physical or mental. <laughs> it doesn't have to be physical, although, frankly, it helps. It's not always possible to get down on your knees. As we get older, I mean, as I get older, it's not as easy to do this or this or this as it used to be. However, the point is, at least mentally, if not physically, we need to be in a posture of submission because we have the privilege of praying with God. <laughs> he allows us. He's willing to hear our prayer. And we have, to, we have to remember that that should be our attitude of prayer. Um, so let's... <clears throat> now let's go on a little bit more. Um, I don't know if when you read these chapters, if you were surprised at Ezra's response about how great and evil this was. Let me, let me back this up a little bit. The numbers of people, yeah, 
the numbers of people, according to Ezra chapter 2, the number of people that actually came for the first wave with Zerubbabel, not with Ezra, but with Zerubbabel, was 42,360 people, right? Now, that's some years before, right? That's like 539. Now we're talking about we're going to just accept the chronology we've been using, so from 539 to 458. So we're talking about like 80 years, right? Well, I don't know what populations were then, but I know that tens of thousands came, and I'm guessing they reproduced, had families, etc. so numbers were probably larger, right? So the point being, the people that it names in verse 18 through 34, 44 that we didn't read, there weren't that many. We're talking about of the priests, 17, of the Levites and the singers, 10, and of Israel proper, 86. There weren't that many people that actually had taken these strange, which essentially means foreign, foreign wives. There, of the total number of people, there weren't that many people. But do you see how big a deal Ezra made of this? Even though a small percentage of the people probably actually engaged in this sin. But now let's, let's get a little bit of the backstory here, okay? Because what have they done? They've taken strange wives and foreign wives. So let's look at why they weren't supposed to do that. Exodus 34. Exodus 34. We're going to look at a little bit of the backstory. Um, Exodus, you may remember, was spoken to the children of Israel before, after they came out of Egypt, but before the 40 years in the wilderness wandering, right? So there was still the potential in the book of Exodus when this was spoken that they were going to actually go into the promised land and have to deal with us. Right? So let's read in verse 12 of Exodus 34. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. But you shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods. And one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice, and thou take of their daughters unto thy sons. And their daughters go a whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go a whoring after their gods. Now, he says, don't mix with the people. He says, knock down the altars, destroy the images. What's the only relationship he prohibits? Marriage. Okay. Now, Exodus 34. Next one, Deuteronomy 7. This was spoken, Deuteronomy chapter 7. This was spoken after the 40 years wandering in the wilderness. <laughs> Exodus 34 was before. Deuteronomy 7 is after. And remember the the purpose of the wandering, God's purpose for making them wander, was that the generation that didn't believe that God would bring them to the promised land would die, which is exactly what they did. So that unbelieving generation is gone now when we, when we read what we read in Deuteronomy 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse uh, 1, just a couple of verses here. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. Only relationship he, prohibit, relationship he prohibits, marriage. So now Ezra is a, remember we saw that in uh, chapter seven, I think it was, where it said Ezra was a ready scribe. So he knew this history. He wrote first and second chronicles. He wrote Ezra and Nehemiah. He knew this history. He knew what the consequence of these 113 people, I think, that had taken strength, he knew what the consequence of that was the first time it happened. The very reason that the captivity itself was that happened because of what they did with mixing with the people of Canaan. The whole thing happened because of that. Now they're coming back from captivity, and they've done the same thing. So you can imagine, Ezra is literally pulling his hair out because he sees 
Okay, so um, as far as a year when this occurred, just to give you a little bit of time frame, the book of uh, the, the Exodus, the, the coming out of the children of Israel from Egypt, okay, that happened at about 1450 BC, right? Okay, so what we you saw the years up there. We were reading about Ezra, and it's 458 BC. So for you um, people who don't work with BC dates a lot, the difference between 1450 and 458, BC dates before Christ, BC dates count down to zero, right? So between 1450 and 450 is a thousand years. So now Ezra's looking back over a thousand years of history. They were warned about it before they went in the land in the first place, and they did it anyway. Actually, um, let's look at, to synopsize that, look at Psalm 106. Psalm 106. <clears throat> so when you see Ezra, um, when he's plucking his beard out, pulling his hair out, rend rending his garment, and throwing himself down in prayer and pleading for forgiveness. He's looking at a thousand years of history. And the, the 70 years prior to when, the 539, when they were set free, that previous 70 years in captivity, all which started with strange wives. Okay. That's what, because that's what he prohibited, that's what Moses prohibited in the first place. Don't do this. And they did it. Psalm 106, verse 34. They did not destroy the nations, verse 34. If you want to read about that, read Judges chapter 1. It's like from 29 to 34 and a couple of verses before that. It's just, and so-and-so didn't test out so-and-so. They continue, and so-and-so didn't test out so-and-so. You know, the Canaanites, and I don't know if you remember, at one point in one of the studies, we talked about the Canaanite religion and the kind of things that they did. And that it was, and we'll read it here too, but it was common for them to have Sex was part of their religion. You know, they would, that's what happened in the, what the Old Testament calls the groves. They were phallic symbols. Um, child sacrifice was part of their religion. Archaeological evidence indicates that they would sacrifice kids up to four years old. And we're not talking a couple. We're talking thousands. So this was all part of the Canaanite religion. And we'll read here. This is what they did. Verse 34. They did not destroy the nations concerning whom the Lord commanded them but were mingled among the heathen and learned their works and they served their idols which were there unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils. Okay, so they were full blown in there, right? And just imagine for a moment your son or your daughter, three, four years old, getting burnt to an idol because that's what they did. They burned them up alive. So this is what, as you're looking at this, and, and this is why he's carrying chaos, because he's looking at something that's a thousand years old and started back there in Canaan, and they did it then, and they did it so much. Look at Second Chronicles chapter thirty-six. Look at Second Chronicles chapter thirty-six. It's right before Ezra and Nehemiah. <clears throat> um, Second Chronicles thirty-six verse. 14. Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his word and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. Finally, God's mercy and God's patience reached its limit. And that's when the people were carried away in captivity. That's what 2 Chronicles 36 is talking about. There was no remedy. God's patience ran out. So he says, okay, you guys are gone for 70 years, and we'll talk about it after that. Okay? And that's when 539 comes and they're back in captivity. So when we see is, uh, Ezra, you can go back to Ezra chapter Ten, if you want to. Um, when we see Ezra in chapter 10 of Ezra have that, this response, you have to consider that he's looking at a thousand years of spiritual dysfunction 
that started with the promised land. They never did what they were told to do. They did exactly what they were told not to do. They mixed with the people. They started the idolatrous practices. Most especially, they married. And that's exactly what they do in Ezra chapter 10. So when he goes bananas, it's for good reason. Because of all that happened. Because they're right, you know, it's like a dog turning to his vomit. That's exactly what it is. They just are going to go right back to it. When I first read that, I thought, wow, that's really kind of over, isn't it? I mean, what kind of severe stuff? But no, it's not. It's not because Ezra loved Israel. Ezra loved God, first of all. Ezra loved Israel, God's people. And Ezra saw the consequence of what they were now doing as the very same thing they've done for a thousand years. And it would have gotten them where they were in the first place. Um, let's look at, oh, I thought this was interesting. The list in uh, Ezra chapter 9, verse 1. Now when the things, now when these things were done, the princes came to me saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands of doing according to their abominations, even Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and Amorites. Now, there's a similar listing. We read it in Deuteronomy 7. There's a similar listing of nations, right? So I just color-coded these. We're talking about a thousand-year time span here between the list of nations that the Deuteronomy list and the list of nations in Ezra. And the colors are the same. There are one, two, three, four, four of those nations. Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, all the same. They're all the same. Right? It's just same stuff, different day. That's all it is. Very same list of nations. Very same stuff. Which brings up a great point, in my opinion. And that is uh, to make an analogy to Christian life now. I mean, obviously, I mean, I don't, I don't know of any Christians who are tempted to fall down and worship a stick or a rock or something like that. I mean, but we are tempted by devilish practices. Remember, we saw, they read in uh, Psalm 106, it says they, interestingly, because in the Old Testament, the word devil doesn't really occur that much, except in the book of Job, I think once in Chronicles. The, the idea of Satan or a devil, like we see in the New Testament, does not occur that much in the Old Testament, except for the book of Job for a couple of chapters. In any case, um, we saw in 106, Psalm 106, that it said they sacrificed their sons and daughters to devils. It specifically said devils, right? So the point being, we deal with the same enemy. It's, he just uses, his motivations are always the same. Look at, um, look at Luke chapter 4. Look at Luke chapter 4 with the temptations in the wilderness. And just kind of by way of synopsis or capsulization, in Luke chapter 4, um, yeah, it's in verse, uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 5. And it says, And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. Now, first of all, I just want to point out again that Jesus didn't call the devil a liar when he made this offer. This was a legitimate offer. He could have done that. The devil, Jesus didn't say, you're a liar, devil, like he did in other contexts. Number one. Number two. There are two things that I'll just point out. I mean, I don't want to oversimplify, but there are two things. Number one, the devil's real motivation based on those verses was worship. He wanted worship. But his, his method of temptation was power. I'll show you, I'll show you everything. I'll give you all this. All you got to do is worship. So what he wanted was worship. What he was willing to give to get that worship was, I'll give you all this power. In general, again, I don't want to oversimplify, but in general, I think for devilish temptations in our lives, his, his motive is always, he always wants worship. And if it can't be worshipped, then it's John 10, 10. The thief comes to not therefore to steal and to kill and to destroy. So it's either I want worship or if you can't have worship, you're dead. One of the two. That's what he wants. But his, his methods of temptation
presentation is generally speaking the categories of pleasure and pressure. He's either going to pressure you into doing something or he's going to entice you by pleasure into doing something. Whatever it is. Little thing, big thing, whatever it is. You know, I'll give you the whole world. All you got to do is worship me. Or, you know what? I think, you know, it can be something small. Uh, you know, you don't really need that. You don't really need to read the Bible. Kids, you don't need to pray for them. No, just have to pray. Or, you know, this one. You know, my wife, as a social worker, works with people who are addicted to drugs. And she, she has told me on a number of occasions, um, and it's really sad, but um, she will tell me that one of the reasons that, so a person who is addicted to drugs, Let's say that recently there's been heroin on the street that was laced with a kind of fentanyl, which is a, a narcotic drug. Okay. Uh, fentanyl is roughly 100 times stronger than morphine. I mean, legitimately, it's 100 times stronger than morphine. So, and there is a kind of fentanyl that they actually use, a variety of fentanyl that they use as um, elephant tranquilizer. So, drug dealers are taking heroin and they lace it with a little bit of, a bit of this really, really and it's referred to as great death when you buy a product. So the point is, if a drug addict hears that that's available, you would think he would say, I don't want that. But what they really say is, I want some of that. Because they're always chasing the first high. And they high, got high the first time, and they got that huge, the top of my head just exploded off. They always want to get to that again. So they're always doing that. So a temptation in that case could be something like, but the devil is going to tempt us with either he wants worship, and if not, he's going to kill you, or, or try. And it, and it may not be physical. It may be over time. And he's going to, he's going to the, his tools, his methods, as Ephesians 6 talks about, are pleasure and pressure. So it's not... This is more blatant. What we see in Ezra is more blatant, doing exactly what they were told not to do and worshiping idols and all that stuff. But the devil does the same to us. It's just a little more subtle. Um, let's. Oh, and along the lines of, I, I thought it was really interesting, having studied God's word recently more with respect to marriage, that what was prohibited in, in Exodus 34. And what was prohibited in Deuteronomy 7, the only relationship prohibited was marriage. That's the only thing he said. Don't take your daughter. Don't give your daughter. The only thing he said not to do. That's the only relationship he said. Don't do that. Why? Because it is so absolutely fundamental to the spirituality of a culture. Absolutely fundamental. If you screw that up, you really screwed up. And the thing I thought of was, um, if you want to turn there, 1 Timothy 3, just, I mean, it's a couple of verses. Um, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, and then he goes to other, other uh, characteristics, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given on, hospitality, appetite, etc. And the other thing I thought of with respect to Ezra 10, and what they did here was, even way back, in, we didn't read Judges chapter 1, but you see in Judges chapter 1 what they didn't do. They didn't kick people out. They didn't, this people group didn't get out. This people group didn't get out. This people group didn't get out. So, and we read in Deuteronomy 7, God's going to cast them out before me. Right? So, what, how, how does that mix together? Um, look at, and to illustrate this for Christians today, look at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. God's promise to us, when we believe it, will come true. Right? But we have to find our focus. Because we have freedom of will. We choose to either believe or not believe what God says. The children of Israel, when they first came out of Egypt and got right to the cup of the promised land, chose not to believe that God could do that. And the consequence of that was they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Who got the final vote there? The people. We always get the final vote. Whether God's word is going to come to pass in our life or not, we always get the final vote. Because we have freedom of will, and God never oversteps that. Now, there are occasions when he pushes it. 
and the record I thought of was this, was this Exodus 3 and 4. Was Moses? No, Moses says, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. Please send somebody else. Okay, fine. Get going. So God pushed him. But he didn't overstep his feet as well. Moses still expressed his mind three or four times. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. We read about it. Jesus Christ himself. I really don't want to do this. Is there another way? You always have the final vote as to whether or not it comes to pass in your life, whether you're willing to believe it or not. So, promised land. God says, I'll push all these nations out. But who had the final say whether that was actually going to happen or not? The people. And whether they believed God would really do that. And whether they were willing to match that with action. And that's what Philippians 2, <clears throat> 13 talks about. Um, actually, we'll start in verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For, because, verse 13, it is God which works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So, as you work out, and your modern translation may have a more kind of graphic way to, to translate that, but as you work out, God works in you. And he works in you not only to do, but he starts with the desire. To will and to do of his good pleasure. But we always have the final vote. We always decide. And that's why when we read about, you know, the prophets, or the, and, and God will, he, he, is, he is patient to a point. But he's patient exhaustively from our perspective. But he's only patient to a point. At some point, like... Second Chronicles 36, 15, 16 says, at some point, there's no remedy. But we always have the final vote as to whether God's word is really going to come to pass. We always have that vote. Um, and I, we won't actually go there, but I thought of that in light of Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It's sort of a practical application. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 is, uh, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, so we're commanded there. Transformed is an imperative. It's a like, clean your room. Okay? It's an imperative. It's a command. You do it. Now, it doesn't mean we do it alone. But that is our responsibility. But we only do it once on time. I mean, the way to change the human mind is just put another thought in it. That's all you got to do. Just put another thought in it. <laughs> all you ever got to do is take one more step. Right? Put one foot in front of the other. Put an, if there's a thought in there that you don't want to think, put another one in there. Ideally, a scriptural thought. But that would be the ideal thing. And if you have scriptures memorized, that can be helpful, although that's not an absolute necessity. But a scriptural, biblical thought is a good thing to renew the mind because we only do it one thought at a time. Really, as much as women will tell me they multitask, they really don't. <laughs> one thought at a time. That's all we got to do. One thought at a time. <laughs> uh, the other thing I thought of, and the, we won't actually, actually we will go there because it's so weird. First Kings uh, chapter 11. Yeah, First Kings. Go to First Kings chapter 11. Relative to this, the meaning of this word strange. 1 Kings chapter 11. This is um, Solomon. And remember, Solomon, when he began to rule, had a vision from God about, you know, he, I mean, he, God communicated with him directly and said, look, you ask for wisdom because you asked any Solomon, you have anything. I want wisdom. Okay, because you did that, I'll give you wisdom, but I'll give you everything else too. So Solomon was, if not the richest man of his time. One of the richest men of his time. Um, so anyway, he had that going for him. So he's the guy that wrote the Proverbs, most of the Proverbs, not all the Proverbs. And if we look at um, 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 1. But King Solomon loved many strange, that is foreign, women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites, now, a couple of those are on that list we just read. Okay? But Solomon had, I forget the specific numbers. Oh, shoot. 
800 wives and 300 concubines, 900 wives and 300 concubines, uh, no, 700, verse 3, and he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, okay? Now, we're talking about 1,000 women. I cannot handle one wife sometimes. He had 1,000 of them, okay? So, anyway, that, that scripture, that, what I wanted to show you was the word strange here, simply means foreign. That is to say, not Israel and not a worshiper of Elohim. That's really what the word strange means. Um, and in your translation, New Orleans, it might say foreign, I don't know. In any case, but what I thought of was, you know, one time, um, my son was here, Louis. Okay, so, yeah, this is our middle son. He was watching the show on TV. About a thousand times a Truly a thousand times a And he, you know, he watched it. He was watching the show and he turned it over for him. He's in like high school at this point. He's like high school. He's a sophomore team. And he's in the park. So in a given month's time, 30 days, we're going to round that off to 3,000 calories. So how much that is body has an energy potential of about 3,500 calories. So again, we're going to round it. So about 3,500 calories. And that means that every month, you gain a pound. So for the first year, you gain 12. For the 10 years, you gain 120. And you only ate one tablespoon of butter every day. Because that's all it takes. It doesn't take a lot. It takes a little over a long time. Okay. And the thing that I... <laughs> the devil does the same thing. He gets us to compromise. He doesn't come out and say, Why don't you worship this gold idol right here? No. No, he gets us to compromise a little bit. He gets us to do a little bit. And I wanted to read you an illustration of that principle. <laughs> and this is, uh, the illustration is entitled, Brownies with a Difference. Many parents are hard pressed to explain to their youth why some music, movies, books, and magazines are not acceptable material for them to bring into the home or to listen to or see. One parent came up with an original idea that is hard to refute. The father listened to all the reasons his children gave for wanting to see a particular PG-13 movie. It had their favorite actors. Everyone else was seeing it. Even church members said it was great. It was only rated PG-13 because of the suggestion of sex. They never really showed it. The language was pretty good. The Lord's name was only used in vain three times in the whole movie. The teens did admit there was a scene where a building and a bunch of people were blown up, but the violence was just the normal stuff. It wasn't too bad. And even if there were a few minor things, the special effects were fabulous and the plot was action-packed. However, even with all the justifications the teens made for the PG-13 rating, the father still wouldn't give in. He didn't even give his children a satisfactory explanation for saying no. He just said no. A little later on that evening, the father asked his teens if they would like some brownies he had baked. He explained that he'd taken the family's favorite recipe and added a little something new. The children asked what it was. The father calmly replied that he had added dog poop. However, he quickly assured them it was only a little bit. All other ingredients were gourmet quality, and he had taken great care to bake the brownies at the precise temperature for the exact time. He was sure the brownies would be superb. 
Even with their father's promise that the brownies were of almost perfect quality, the teens would not take any. The father acted surprised. After all, it was only one small part that was causing them to be so stubborn. He was certain they would hardly notice it. Still, the teens held firm and would not try the brownies. The father then told his children how the movie they wanted to see was just like the brownies. Our minds turn us into believing that just a little bit of evil won't matter. But the truth is, even a little bit of poop makes the difference between a great treat and something disgusting and totally unacceptable. The father went on to explain that even though the movie industry would have us believe that most of today's movies are acceptable for adults and youth, they are not. Now when his father's this father's children want to see something that is of questionable material, the father merely asks them if they would like some of his special dog poop brownies. That closes the subject. And a couple of scriptures along those lines. Uh, First Corinthians, we don't have to turn there necessarily, but 1 Corinthians 5, 5. Um, <laughs> Paul asks this rhetorically. He says, don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? If you've ever made bread, you know, you got a bunch of dough, and you put leaven in it, and then you knead the dough. You only put the leaven in one spot. The kneading process gets it throughout. And, you go, and, and Jesus Christ calls attention to this as well in Matthew 16, 6. Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Right? And if you remember, the, <laughs> the disciples totally misunderstand. Did you bring any bread? No. And then he corrects and says, look, take beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So he points out, so the devil gets us to compromise a little at a time. A little at a time. Just like he did with the children of Israel, except he started a thousand years before. They didn't start out by sacrificing the kids' idols. They started out by taking a strange wife, and then the strange wife says, I'm going to go to church over there today. You go ahead. I'll go over there. And then, well, I'll go with you. Well, and then they get to the point where a little and a little and a little and a little and a little, and all of a sudden, Susie. Susie, we have to sacrifice you to the idol. And that's how big it can get. 